And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servants of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. And the servant saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But he again denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is the truth, amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Listen to this brief story. A couple married for 15 years began to have more disagreements than usual. But they still wanted to make their marriage work. So they agreed on an idea. For one month every day, they planned to drop a slip in each other's fault box. (laughs) the boxes will provide a place to let the other know their daily irritations and the other person's faults. And the wife was diligent in her efforts and approach, leaving the jelly on top of the jar, wet towels on the shower floor, dirty socks in the hamper, too much time on the cell phone or TV, no leadership, no courage, and on and on she wrote on each slip in all caps until the end of the month when she would give her husband what for. At the end of the month, they exchanged boxes. The husband read each uninspiring slip and didn't change. He was just crushed. Then the wife opened her box and began reading each slip. And as she did, she began to cry. Why? Because the message on each slip was the same. Every single slip read, I love you. And that wife was never the same. She, was, she wasn't just convicted and brought to tears, she was transformed by her husband's grace-filled love. So often people picture God like the wife in that story. Eager, longing to hand us our fault box and give us what for? Give us hell. That's uninspiring, and that is a false perspective of God. 2 Timothy 2.4 says, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the knowledge of the truth that's being referred to? It's Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Salvation. 1 Peter 2.8, The Lord is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, which leads to salvation, which leads to love. Ezekiel 18.32, I have no pleasure, God speaking, in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. And how bad does God want us to turn and live? 1 John 4.10 makes it clear. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice 
for our sins. That means Jesus took every single slip of sin in our fault box and wrote on it, forgiven, paid in full, I love you. And when we accept that, when we believe in that, when we dwell and grow in the convicting yet grace-filled love of Jesus Christ, what happens? The same thing that that happened to that wife, how she was transformed by grace-filled love, you and I are transformed by Jesus' grace-filled love. The more the love of God invades, the more pride dissipates. The more selfishness dissolves. The more slavery to fear goes away. And the reality of being a child of God, a beloved child of God, sets in. And I'm not making this up. This is not wishful thinking. This is a reality that we are going to see in our passage today. Peter's going to fill up his fault box. He's going to fill it to the brim and then some. But then he's going to have a run in with Jesus. He's going to have a run in with the convicting, grace filled love of Jesus. And he is going to be transformed. His pride, his arrogance, his fear, it's going to dissolve. And he is going to become a joy filled, power filled, beloved child of God. Look in your Bibles at verse 66. We start with Peter filling his fault box. It says, As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. Now when it says, as Peter was below in the courtyard, that's in relation to Jesus Christ. Where is Peter at? What courtyard is he at? He's in Caiaphas's courtyard, and he's below in the courtyard, and Jesus is above in the upper room of Caiaphas's house. On what? He is on trial. And as Jesus is on trial above, Peter is below. And he's approached by this little girl. We know from the Greek text here and the words being used that this little girl is probably 12 years old or younger. She's just entering into junior high school or she's just at the end of her elementary career. She's a little girl and she approaches Peter. And what happens? Verse 67, and seeing Peter warming himself by the fire of the courtyard, and Peter, and seeing Peter warming himself, looked, she looked at him, light of the fire illuminates his face, and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. This little girl does exactly what Peter doesn't want her to do. He, she, excuse me, identifies Peter with Christ says, you are with Jesus the Nazarene. You're one of the disciples. As a follower of Jesus Christ, as a Christian, what is one of our greatest desires? That people would look at us and identify us with who? Identify us with Christ. That we would be in the world, but not of it. We would stand out for Jesus Christ. That is one of the followers of Christ's greatest desires. But that's not Peter's desire. He's not rejoicing here. He doesn't say, yes, hallelujah, I am with Christ. I stand up for Him. Now look what he does in verse 68. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. The word know here is oida. It refers to theoretical knowledge. The word here for understand is episteme. It refers to practical knowledge. Peter is saying, in every shape, In every form, in every way, I don't know Jesus. It's an emphatic denial. I don't know him. It's an outright lie. And think about this. As he's below in the courtyard, facing this little girl, lying, what is Jesus doing in the upper room of Caiaphas' house? Who is he facing? 
He's facing Annas, the high priest, former high priest, whose evil was proverbial in Israel. He's facing Caiaphas, the current high priest, and he's facing the Sanhedrin, 72 leaders who are absolutely corrupt and who for the past three years have been hell-bent on killing Jesus. And as Jesus is facing that, what does he do? He proclaims the truth. Despite the cost, he says, I am the Messiah, I am the Son of God. Despite it bringing him one more step closer to the cross, he proclaims the truth. He's above in the room, he's doing that. Peter's down below. And he is emphatically denying Christ. And look at the verse, middle of verse 68. It says, and he went out into the gateway. It's sort of like, literally, he's going further away from Christ. He's going away from the illuminating light of the fire, further into the darkness, filling his fault box all the more. And what happens next? We come to the next verse, or excuse me, the end of verse 68, and it says, and the rooster crowed. Verse 30 of Mark chapter 14, Jesus told Peter what? That before the rooster crows twice, he would deny him three times. And you would think the rooster crowing here would cause something to register in Peter's mind, change his behavior. And we know Peter heard the crow because Mark is writing this, and who's guiding Mark, aside from the Holy Spirit, in writing this? Who's giving him the information? It's Peter. So Peter hears the rooster crow, But like a broken record, what does he do? He continues to fill his fault box. And we come to verse 69, And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. The word deny here is in the imperfect continuous sense. And what that means is Peter is not making a single statement, but he's sounding off like an obnoxious fire alarm that won't turn off. He is vehemently denying Christ. Vehemently denying Christ. And we come to the next verse and it says, but again he denied him, verse 70, and after a little while the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Now how would they know he's a Galilean? Because Peter's been spouting off denial and they recognize something. They recognize an accent. Galileans had a very distinct accent. So they pick on this accent, pick up this accent, and they're like, wow, wait a second. All the disciples except one were Galileans. And they're like, that's just another evidence of who you really are. You are one of the twelve. You are one of Jesus' followers. They identify him. And what is Peter's response? Same old, same old. Look at verse 71. But he began to invoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. When it says he invokes a curse upon himself... That would be like you accusing me of something and me saying, let me be damned if I am lying. Jesus is the one who enabled Peter to walk on water. Jesus is the one, when Peter sank, saved him. Matthew chapter 14. Jesus is the one in Mark chapter 2 that healed a family member of Peter. Now, it was his his mother-in-law, so that may have been the problem, but... (laughs) Did I just say that? (laughs) Luke chapter 10. Jesus gives Peter what? Power to cast out demons, power to preach and change lives. Matthew chapter 16, what does Jesus make Peter, the leader amongst the twelve, who is going to be the lead in building up the church of God? Jesus is Peter's God. He is his Lord. He is his friend. And Peter does love Jesus. But here, he is vehemently uttering blasphemy, swearing up a storm, saying, I don't know him. What brought Jesus? Peter to this point. How could he do this? What are the steps he took to come to this point where he is filling his fault box with things he never dreamed he would do? 
What is bringing Peter, the one Jesus nicknamed the rock? What is making him fall? What has brought him to this point where he can fall so hard and so deep? Four steps he took. Turn back to Matthew chapter 14, verse 26. Few hours before our scene in verses 66 through 72, what happens? Jesus and the 11 disciples, Judas has already left. Jesus and the 11 disciples, including Peter, are headed up to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they're headed up, Jesus says, what of all the 12 disciples? Verse 27, you will all fall away. And what is Peter's response? He says in verse 29, Peter said, even though they all fall away, I will not. The first step in Peter's downfall uh, brings him to a point where he can do what he does at the end of chapter 14 is conceit. He's the one sitting in the pew under Jesus' teaching and saying, wow, this is good stuff for everybody else. I wish so-and-so could hear this. I'm good, but wow. He reminds me of, the, reminds me of myself at the beginning of my marriage. Thinking, you know what, it's only others who are ever going to have difficulty. It's only others who are going to struggle. It's only others that are going to have problems with marriage, but not perfect little old me. There was a person in my wing, in my dorm, in college, who struggled with pornography. And this person really struggled with it. He was battling against it. And one of my other friends would look at him and just say, how could you ever even do that? How could you fall that far? How could you be that disgusting? How could you just, how could you ever enter into that? That was his mindset. I would never do that. Six months later, he was doing the same thing. Conceit is the first step that brings him to a point where he does what he does at the end of chapter 14. The proverb is true. Pride comes before the fall. What's the second step? It's defiance. Look at verse 30. Jesus said to him, as I've referenced before, truly I say to you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But what does Peter do? He blows Jesus off. He blows the authoritative God, the Son, off. He blows the person. He was at the Mount of Transfiguration. He heard God the Father say of Jesus, this is my beloved Son, listen to Him. But what does he say? Verse 31, but he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And what is always the result of defiance against a proper authority? It's destruction. It's disunity. It's slander. It's gossip. It's misery. Always. Junior year of high school. There was a player on the team who thought he was the next Pele. Wow, was his head big like Peter's. Thought he was the next Pele, thought he owned the team, thought he could do whatever he want, thought he was always right. And finally one day before the game, when we're getting on the bus to go to the game, the coach had enough and said, that's it. You don't own this team? Who do you think you are? Get off the bus, you're not playing today. Get off. We don't need your attitude here. And what did that player do? Proudly, defiantly, stood up, started yelling, started cursing. Massive argument. Eventually, he leaves the bus, and where does he go to? He goes straight to the administrative office and makes up this huge lie that the coach had taken him, had beat him down, literally threw him off the bus. And what happened as a result of that defiance? I'll tell you, not just for that student, not just for the coach, but for everybody, it was misery. Defiance, lack of submission, 
insubordination. It's sort of what our culture celebrates today. But Jesus doesn't celebrate that. We know this. We know that defiance against the proper authority, we know that insubordination, we know that that leads to destruction, that leads to disunity, that that leads to everything un-Jesus. FBC here, we have a, a rich history of unity. Rich history of unity. It is awesome. It is something to celebrate. But we all know at times, maybe even in us, we can have that defiance against that proper authority. And what is always the product? Even for the defiant person, is always misery. There's no joy. There's no Christ-likeness produced. But today, like every day, what do we have as we look at this second step of Failure that brings Peter closer to this horrific moment. We have an opportunity to do what we've been trying and trying and trying to do. To run away from that spirit of defiance. To run away from that and adopt that spirit of unity. To join in on what Jesus is doing here. What a phenomenal thing. It's so obvious that God is on the move. It's so obvious that God is working in here. And we have the opportunity today, tomorrow, the next day, to join in that. Amen? What's the third step? The third step that brings Peter closer to what he does in 66 through 72 is lack of preparation. Lack of preparation. In verses 32 through 42, you probably remember it. Jesus is going up to the, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's in agonizing prayer, prepping for the cross. Prepping for the cross. And he wants Peter and he wants the rest of the disciples to join him in prepping for the trial of the cross. To adopt the position of power, which is the position of prayer, but what position does Peter adopt? He adopts the weakest position there is. He adopts the most vulnerable position there is. He doesn't prepare. He doesn't adopt and adopt the position of power. He falls asleep, literally. And what happens when it all hits the fan and Peter and excuse me, Jesus is arrested and Jesus is taken on trial? What happens? What is Peter like? He's like a deer in the headlights. He is stunned. He is clueless. He is unprepared. And it just enables his failure. What's the fourth step? We see it in verses 43 through 65. It's called negotiating with the truth. Peter's a follower of Christ. He knows what that means. That means you stick close to Christ. Wherever he goes, you go. No matter what. But he is so full of fear, he's so full of weak self, what Jesus calls the flesh, that when it comes to standing by the truth, he can't. He negotiates with the truth. He runs away. He stays at a distance. And all of this leads to what? It leads to this point in verse 66 through 72 where Peter is doing things he never thought he would. And we finally come to verse 72. And the text says, after these three denials, and immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you would deny me three times, and he broke down and wept. Peter's finally got a full picture of what he's done. He's finally got a clear view of his fault box and the just amount of disgusting sin that he has just poured into it. And as a result of Jesus' loving actions prior to what happens that enables him to see it and that breaks him down and that makes him weep. The, conviction, the convicting words of Jesus Christ bring him down. They make him weak. And they make him weep. But the love of Jesus doesn't just convict, it transforms. It absolutely transforms. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts 
Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22. Acts chapter 2 at the beginning. Who's Peter facing? He's facing a mocking mob. A mob that is facing a group of believers and mocking them. And you would think, based on his track record, Mark chapter 14, that what is he going to do? He's going to run. He's going to fail. He's going to deny. He's going to practice personal safety first instead of God first, other second. Based on his track record, you're expecting failure from Peter. But Peter, something's happened to Peter. Look at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. He says to this mocking mob, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus was Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did him did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. What does Peter do? The exact opposite of what he did in Matthew, or Mark chapter 14. He doesn't lie. He proclaims the truth of Jesus Christ. And what's the result? Verse 41. So all those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Go down to Acts chapter 4. Beginning of Acts chapter 4, we see 5,000 more people come to Christ as a result of proclaiming, Peter proclaiming the truth like he didn't before. Acts chapter 4, 5,000 people come to Christ in the first four verses. And look who he faces in verse 5. Look who he faces. Look who he's on trial in front of. Verse 5, on the next day there are rulers and elders and scribes, that's the Sanhedrin, the 72 that Jesus faced in the upper room, gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who are of the high priestly family. Peter's in front of the same group Jesus was in Mark chapter 14. The exact same group. And what does he say? Look at verse 11. He says of Jesus, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He proclaims the truth. And we come to chapter 5, and he's in front of the same murderous group. And what does he do again? Acts chapter 5, verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance, repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. What happened to Peter? Here, he is not the sniveling coward. Here, he is not full of conceit. Here, he is not insubordinate to a proper authority. What happened between Mark chapter 14 and Acts chapter 2, 4, and 5? The cross happened. Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for every single one of Peter's sins. He went to the cross and took every slip in his fault box and wrote, paid in full, forgiven, I love you. So when Jesus rose from the grave in Mark chapter 16, and the ladies went to that grave, that open grave, and the angel met them and told them, Jesus has risen from the dead. That angel tells those ladies, tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. And who does that angel mention by name? Saying, make sure 
That disciple is in Galilee. Mark 16, 7. Mark 16, 7. But go, angel speaking to these ladies, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Why does the angel say that? Number one, because God obviously has instructed him to. Jesus has instructed him to. But two, I think this angel's doing this with this massive smile on his face, just thinking, I can't wait to see this. I can't wait to see Peter come up to Jesus and realize what Jesus has done with his fault box, smothered it with his loving blood. I can't wait to see that. And that's exactly what happens. John 21, Peter has an interaction with Jesus. And he is absolutely transformed. He is turned from the person of Mark chapter 14 to the person of Acts chapter 2, 4, and 5. He is full of the courageous joy and power of being a transformed, beloved child of God. Today, if you want love that transforms, if you want love that takes every slip in your fault box, like with Peter, and writes, I love you, the person you need to meet, the person you need to believe in, is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ didn't just go to the cross and pay for Peter's sin. He went to the cross and He paid for the world's sin. So that all who believe in Him, all who turn to Him, all who have a run in with Him can be forgiven and set free. Listen to this. Carl Menninger was a psychiatrist in the 19th, or excuse me, 20th century, mid-20th century. And he said this, He said that if he could convince his patients in the psychiatric, yeah, I can't say that word, psychiatric hospital, all right, the ward, if he could convince his patients that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them would walk out the next day, no problems, absolutely cured. The weight of sin the weight of our fault box, the weight of shame, the weight of guilt is something that bears us down, takes us down, and we can't solve. But Jesus Christ has solved that problem. He's written on every single one of your faults and mine, I love you. Believe in me. Accept that love. Today, if you haven't already, believe in Jesus Christ and the love that he has for you and be transformed Be turned into a child of God who speaks courageously with joy and power. Today, for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, the application is this. This is called communion. This is an act of remembrance. This is saying, yes, Jesus, you did do that. Not just for Peter, but for me. That's what communion is. The blood represents, excuse me, the the cup represents the blood of Jesus Christ. The bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. The life that he gave for you and me. Listen, today, if a current sin or a past sin is weighing you down, is making you weep, is making you doubt your salvation, is causing you to lose track of the assurance of your faith, assurance of where you're going in Jesus Christ. Remember what we looked at today. Remember this. This represents the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was nailed to a cross and used to wash away your sin, to make you right with God as you turn to Him. On every slip of sin is I love you. Right now I'm going to ask the elders and those who are helping with communion to come forward. And what I would like to do 
is just think on this. Just remember this. And just let it wash over us. My application was going to be write down your sins, cross it out, and write I love you next to every single one. That's what we're doing here, essentially. We're saying that's what happened. That's what Jesus did. That's who I am. I am a loved child of the King, Jesus Christ. Let's go into a moment of silence. I will pray. And then we will deliver the element.